Okay, everyone, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University. Um, we are launching our new and improved webinar series called LMU Business Insights. And today our focus will be on data analytics. My name is Nola Wanta and I'm the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to go over some basic um, webinar and community guidelines. So for all of our attendees, please do type your questions in the Q&A window. These questions will be moderated after the presentation. Also, you're welcome to use the chat window to post your comments only for other attendees and for the panelists. You're welcome to uh, send us your comments directly for our, the panelists and the speaker, but please do use the Q&A window for your questions and we will be moderating those questions at the end of the presentation. And also just as a friendly reminder that this webinar uh, will be recorded and will be available after the presentation. So now I would like to turn it over to Professor Anna Mangal, who teaches our Management of Information Systems for our graduate programs, who will be introducing um, our speaker for tonight. So, Anna. Thank you, Nola. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I am uh, joining you all in welcoming our guest speaker this evening, Tim Park. Uh, I met Tim when he was at, uh, uh, at uh, DirecTV, uh, which got acquired by at and and um, and since then he's moved to Sony Pictures. Uh, Tim is responsible at Sony Pictures uh, for establishing a new corporate data management function. He's bridging the gap between business needs and data systems to spearhead cross-functional analytics initiatives. Tim is also using transactional and viewership data to drive brand awareness and discover target audiences to optimize marketing campaigns. Prior to joining Sony Pictures, Tim headed up the analytics department at DirecTV at and where he fostered a data-driven culture to help deliver a premium viewing experience. He also worked as a statistician at the Aerospace Corporation uh, R&D center that provides technical guidance to the US Air Force on all aspects of space missions. Furthermore, he has taught statistics and math at LMU, yay, UCLA, and the Aerospace Institute. Mr. Park holds a bachelor's degree in math and physics from Occidental College and an MBA from the UCLA Anderson School of Management. Welcome, Tim. Thank you so much. Um, should I share my screen now? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Let me. And let me know if you can see my screen and see if I'm in presentation mode. Not quite yet. Not quite, okay. I, but, but the audience I can see your full, there we go. Okay, I think it's coming. I, I blame Spectrum, so it's... <laughs> So I think we're good now, is that right? Yes, you're good to go. Uh, okay. Well, thank you all for, uh, for making the time tonight. Thank you very much, Professor Mangal and uh, Dean Smith for inviting me also to Nola and Nancy uh, for setting this up for this webinar. It's much appreciated. Um, I, I did teach a probability and statistics course back in the LMU uh, engineering department many years ago. And uh, I really wish we could, we could be doing this in person on your beautiful campus, but um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight and we'll make the most of it. Thank you for all for making the time. Uh, so, but before I, I officially get started, I have to uh, share this disclaimer, which basically says that what I'm sharing today is I'm just representing myself and nobody else. And so um, 
just take it for what it is. And uh, for those who are interested, I can make these uh, slides available later as well. Uh, so a little bit about me, as uh, Professor Mengal described, um, I, was, I was born and raised in LA, went, went to Oxy, studied uh, math and physics. Um, it's a liberal arts school, but I think by going there, it forced me to be a better writer and it helped me in my technical field. I went to, uh, my first job was at the Aerospace Corporation down in El Segundo, and I worked in the uh, reliability and statistics department. Uh, we were predicting when satellites would fail, such as the GPS systems, and providing go, no, no go launch decisions for classified missions, uh, and, and uh, also supported the uh, Missile Defense Agency. So a lot of, a lot of really cool classified work, especially uh, during 9-11, I was there. So it was definitely some, some serious and intense, but very meaningful, meaningful work. I was at the point in my career where I was, should I go get a master's in engineering since that was the field I was in, or should I go get a master's, say like an MBA? And so I, I chose the latter and I went to, uh, went to UCLA to uh, um, Anderson and I, I focused on marketing and entrepreneurship, trying to, trying to balance my left brain and right brain. And then um, I got my, my first um, people management position at DirecTV. Um, I started with a small team of two, and when I left, I had uh, over 20 direct reports. So it was it was a great, really rewarding and challenging at the same time. An opportunity came up at a direct at a Sony. I was there heading up a new strategic initiative, and so I've been here since uh, since 2017. Uh, a couple of things I want to also mention is uh, I had an opportunity to do a startup right after business school with a, with a classmate, and uh, it was a DVD production company. I knew nothing about it, but it was a great way to just kind of dive in, and it, it was a great experience uh, for about two years, but then my partner, the brain behind the company, had to move, move away, and so we had to shut it down, but it was actually really profitable in year one. It was a great learning experience, and currently on the side, I'm also working on a startup called Prenostic. Where we're trying to improve graduate graduation rates um, with STEM major ret major uh, retention, and we're trying to be like the Fitbit for education, and so it's kind of something we're doing on the side as well. Um, uh, but today the focus is going to be on data, and we're going to start off by what is what is Moneyball, right? And we'll talk about that. How do we? What are some of the pillars that we need for building a data driven culture? And then. Um, what are the pillars? So I'm going to start with leadership, obviously being the first one. What are some of the uh, pipelines that we need to have the right foundation and plumbing? Third, what are the necessary tools and skills to be successful in this data arena? And then lastly, to reflect and ask the uh, so what question, right? In other words, is my work and analysis really helping the bottom line of the company? So as you can see here, there's a lot here and each pillar can easily be a class or a seminar on its own. Um, but I'm gonna do my best to give you a, an overview of how a data-driven culture can, can really yield insights. So let's start with, uh, with the leadership pillar. And so many of you may remember this 2017 cover from The Economist. And it says that the world's most valuable resource, right, is no longer oil, but data. And it emphasizes that um, the rapid growth of certain digital companies, and we know that five out of the six largest companies in the world, at least measured by market capitalization, are data technology companies, right? Uh, Google and Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Microsoft, right? Five out of the six um, are, are digital data companies. So why, why Moneyball? And I'm gonna start with this uh, Dilbert comic strip, right? So why are we going ahead with the plan when the data says it cannot succeed? And the boss says, I manage by instinct and gut feelings. How's that different from being insane or stupid? My gut says I should not listen to you. So I just thought this was a kind of a funny way to, to start, off the, uh, start off the seminar. And this isn't to discount our experience or business acumen. It's just that now that we have powerful data at our fingertips, what can we do with it to really cultivate a data-driven culture? So, so what is Moneyball, right? It's based on a book written by Michael Lewis in 2003. 
and it's about the Oakland A's. It's a small market team, right? Would had a small payroll and went up against teams such as the Yankees, whose payroll were easily double what the Oakland A's had. And uh, of course, it was a successful book. And so what do we do? We always make a movie out of it. And in 2011, uh, Sony, we made, a, we, made a, we made a book starring, starring Brad Pitt. And kind of the first poll question, if you can write in the chat window, if you've read the book, uh, write book. If you've, if you've watched the movie, type in movie. If you've watched the movie and uh, read the book, if you can type in both, I'll get a feel of those, uh, kind of uh, what background we have with with um with the uh with moneyball okay i see a lot of movies here a lot of movies okay excellent excellent okay okay all right so uh with that uh for those of you who haven't uh let me um i see some both in there awesome also i actually personally thought the book was better than the movie but anyway uh let me show you a quick clip for the movie this is a two minute video clip for the movie and i, I hope it works All right. So, what are some of the uh, some of the key takeaways? I think the first one is to be open, right, to ideas um, that we're not comfortable with. Get away from our comfort zone, right? I think there's a saying that we say, "Oh, that's the way we've always done it," right, and we keep our head buried in the sand. Uh, but that's definitely not the way to do it, right? There's innovative productivity moving beyond the way, right? It's always been done. A second takeaway is that the Oakland A's were successful because they found value, right? value that others were missing. And with the correct data, um, there are opportunities for us to find value in our businesses to become more efficient and to become more profitable. But I think the main takeaway that I, wanna, that I want us to remember from Moneyball and based on this Forbes magazine is highlighted here, right? Moneyball succeeded, not necessarily because of analytics, but because of the leader, right? So the key here is that there's a leader. And I know a lot of business school students are here. And at the end of the day, we're all trying to become better leaders. And because of his vision and his drive, and he understood the potential, um, we can apply that and know that we have the best data at our fingertips. And we can actually drive change much more easily and much more efficiently um, with this data in our hands now. I want to also go over some other businesses that are applying these Moneyball principles. Um, the NFL, right? I think the 
analytics departments have really grown right in these NFL clubs uh, for just this past weekend, the Green Bay Packers right on fourth on fourth and eight, uh, Aaron Rodgers, he decided they decided to go for the field goal right instead of instead of the touchdown. They have books and studies on when you should go for go for two after a touchdown when you should kick the field goal, etc. Right, Ikea was successful because they went to Poland to get furniture manufactured at the time. The labor was really inexpensive. So obviously a huge, a huge profit boost for them. In 2007, Ann Milgram was the, uh, became the attorney general for New Jersey. And in, in her words, she wanted to quote unquote moneyball criminal justice, right? Basically decide based on facts rather than, rather than personal biases. Uh, revenue managers at Marriott now are using predictive analytics to maximize profits from their room rates by forecasting models, and their marketing departments are optimizing their communication to target and time their messages, it's rather than going the spray and pray email blast that uh, many companies use. Uh, Zillow, right, is using historical and real-time data for their Zillow offers program, which is an easier and quicker way to sell your home rather than going through the traditional real estate broker route. And last, but certainly not least, um, Netflix's powerful recommendation engine, which we're very familiar with, is based on what viewership preferences people have. And it's been a huge disruptor for us, not even before COVID, uh, in the entertainment industry. And because of Netflix, right, we have these terms um, such as binge watching. Right, and so in the in the chat window, I want you to type in uh, whether it's Netflix or not. Type in some of your favorite TV shows that you are currently watching, or you might have just finished. So I'm looking forward to seeing you know, what people, what are oh, Bridgerton, Money Heist, okay, Succession, a Queen's Gambit. I just finished watching that as well. Cobra Kai, definitely in the '80s. Yeah, Mandalorian, okay. Breaking Bad, okay. Grey's Anatomy, Office, yes, okay. Crown, yeah, that's a Sony one. It's, it's a great one. I just finished uh, season four, I believe. Loop and I have Ozarks, yeah. I just that's a really okay. So as we know, looks like a lot of us are being engaged in Game of Thrones, yes, HBO. Okay. Um, so yeah, we get some great, great feedback here. And so Netflix does a great job of using this viewership history, and they're using their machine learning to recommend what content for us to keep watching and to keep us to keep us engaged. And so what is a data-driven company? And I think you can classify it at a, broad, at a high level into two categories. And the first one I want to talk about is those who say they are data-driven. And these are often companies where the decisions are made by what we call the hippo, right? The highest paid person in the room makes a top-down decision and then that's it, right? That's kind of, that's kind of, that's kind of it. These companies also sometimes rely completely on consulting companies and just let them kind of drive the ship and just follow them blindly, right? And co consulting companies obviously can bring great value, but at the same time, they don't know your business, your day in and day out businesses like you do. Okay? Data integrity is often never questioned. It's just like this, it is what it is, okay? Data often is used to justify one's decisions and show their self-worth rather than using it to, to drive decisions. And dashboards are often used to show off kind of their success rather than to glean insight. So these are examples of companies who simply just say or claim to be they are data-driven. But the second category is those who really are data-driven companies. And I wanna say, they st it starts from the top, right? You have to have the vision and the executive sponsor has to start uh, from the top and saying, we, we are gonna do this, okay? And a good way to do that is to start by focusing on real business problems that's gonna help the bottom line. And what I found is if you tackle some of these quick wins, right? Rather than trying to solve, you know, world hunger, right? Start with something smaller that you can really get a victory and build some momentum off of. Make sure the data quality is there and the data is accessible. And these companies also invest in data literacy, literacy and tooling for, for, their, for their employees. Testing and learning is, is a common theme. 
and they're okay with failing, right? The faster you fail, the more you can learn and the more you can, uh, you can learn from it rather than being so afraid of making a mistake. And KPIs is something that we're all familiar with or key performance indexes, but I think having the right success metrics is going to really direct your ship of the company as to where we want to go with, um, with our long-term success. So those are the examples of or characteristics of, comp of companies that are truly data-driven. And I also want to touch briefly on digital transformation because there's so many fundamental similarities with this digital transformation as there is in creating a data-driven culture. Um, the vision, once again, has to start from the top. And quick wins are needed to build that, to get the buy-in, right, before you invest a ton of capital in changing business processes. I think one thing I want to say is that I don't think digital transformation can happen without having a data-driven culture as your foundation first, right? Then once you have that, then if you're getting data digitally, you can make enhancements in sales, marketing, and other customer service areas. And so the next step in building a data-driven culture, I want to say is you want to have, you need to have solid plumbing, right? And in a uh, Daniel Craig, James Bond movie, right? Water becomes the kind of the, the biggest goal. It replaces oil, gold, diamonds, and weapons, right? And which James Bond movie was that the theme, right? And um, type your answer in the window. Is it A, Casino Royale? B, Quantum of Solace, C, Skyfall, D, Spectre, or E, No Time to Die, which has just been pushed. I see some answers coming in, okay. Feel free to guess, right? feel free to guess. You're not being graded on it, no idea whatsoever, that's fine. For some of you may not, this is way before your time. Okay, we're getting some good answers, okay. And the correct answer is Quantum of Solace, okay. And so in the first section, we talked about, you know, data as kind of the new oil. And this second pillar, I want to shift and say, what if data, we think of data as the new water, and hence the uh, necessary analytics pipelines is kind of where I want to go with this next, with this next pillar, okay? So the first step is we have to make sure we gather, filter, and clean the data. This is before we even store it. And I think there's kind of four ways to really uh, acquire the data, right? First, we have our legacy data. We need to make sure we convert it and transform it to what we want. We want to make sure we share and exchange the different data that we have internally. Then we want to start collecting new data, whether it's being automated through an API or whether we're manually, hopefully not too much of this is happening, but I know it still happens today. Right, and then there's the idea of we need to purchase third-party data or industry data. So these are all very important steps of make sure, make, of acquiring all this data. One thing we have to also remember to do is make sure we have these checks or we, what we've done is we built these reconnaissance dashboards to check is the data quality coming through. Okay, so make sure we do that. Just because you have the pipeline built, you have to always make sure that data quality is correct as well. We need to have the right architecture, right? The right blueprint, just like building a house. We need to make sure that we can understand the business needs and we turn those into system requirements, right? We have some legacy integrated data that has been labeled possibly too slow. We have some mo possibly modern data lakes that suffer from curation, security, or usability and data duplication issues. But we wanna make sure we have the right data architecture and blueprints for the data ecosystem. And I think in order to get this right, there has to be a strong collaboration between the business needs and the IT need and the IT leaders. And so the business needs start with questions that they're trying to answer. And IT can then partner using their technical expertise to truly collaborate to find, okay, what blueprint is really going to work for us? And there's no one, one answer or one, one size fits all to this. Every company is different. Every business is different and things evolve over time. So we also, let's say we have the data now, we need to find a place to store it. And this is a hotly debated topic between say IT and finance because there are definitely pros and cons and there's price differences 
for whether we keep all our data on site on prem or do we go with kind of the, the the public cloud or do we do kind of a hybrid and go with the private cloud right and so there's all all different ways a bunch of different companies trying to trying to solve this and there's there's no uh there's no perfect solution i don't think and here's a kind of a nice summary of some of the characteristics of public versus private versus say a hybrid cloud storage. And there are two, two things I wanna highlight here. Uh, the first thing I wanna highlight obviously is cost, right? And so for those who have on-prem uh, storages, right? It's very expensive, but there are definitely advantages of having control over your own data. And there's also a very important issue of security, right? Of having control over it versus say something in the cloud. Um, and so there are two things that we'll have to keep in mind, especially as we go forward. And in this next section, I wanna delve a little bit deeper into, into, the, security, into the security side. Um, and I know uh, Professor Ken, I, I believe has a class strictly on just cybersecurity as well. And this is a huge, a huge topic. Um, this is something that unfortunately happens quite a bit. The more and more we become dependent and engage with data, this is kind of a, a byproduct, unfortunately. Uh, phishing threats, I think we're all familiar with that. We still get the uh, Nigerian print emails. And so always be careful of that. Uh, I just got one from PayPal saying, but they spelled it PayPal, P-A-Y-P-A-I with a capital I. And so always be careful of little things like that. Um, anytime we're, we're online, right, we're at the threat of ransomware attacks. And so those are always, always out there. Social media scams for those of us who are on our phone a lot, whether, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you name it, right? It, there's always people trying to scam us and try to get our data. For those of us who are students or working professionals, right, there's the it's very tempting when someone offers you kind of a recruiting and you feel great. Like, oh, someone wants me to go work for them. And you always have to be very careful, even from reputable sources such as LinkedIn, because it could be, it could be a scam. Okay. Uh, email, email invoice fraud is something that's actually growing as well. This is kind of an internal thing where you think, oh, it's coming from say the procurement office in our group. And you always have to be very careful as to is this, is, this, is this invoice legit, right? So make sure you double check that as well. Uh, last but certainly not least is with cryptocurrency, I think Bitcoin is, is taking off again in the stock market and there's um, kind of this whole dark web of, of scary stuff that's going on out there. So in other words, just be very careful with, um, with anything you do online. And if you think of it from a company's perspective, you have this valuable data we have to make sure we protect it. Um, Robert Mueller, right, he was the FBI director back in the day, and he says there are only two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that will be. And unfortunately, that is happening way too often, right? Even for Fortune 500 companies, where we're investing a ton of money into protecting ourselves, we're, we're still vulnerable. And here's just a list of some of these big companies that have been impacted, which is unfortunate, but it just tells us how dangerous and how active some of these um, some of these companies are are being threatened by by hackers. This is another field, um, especially those who work with customer data, PII data, personally identifiable information, right? And this has to do with say anything that you can identify yourself with, whether it be a social security number, your name, an ID, your birth date, birthplace, uh, even an email address, right? You have to be very careful um, as to what you can and cannot share. And when you join data, even internally, there are a lot of rules on what you can and cannot join together. And so um, just be very careful, work with your, your, uh, your legal team, your business affairs teams to make sure that you can uh, share this with internally and what you can join together. There are other 
rules out there as well, not only in Europe, but especially even just for California. I know there was a proposition in the fall of, and it was really confusing as to, you know, is voting yes a good thing, voting no a good thing? Uh, but it's the idea of we don't want kind of big brother watching over us um, and collecting all our data. But we know that a lot of it is happening, right? Those of us on our phones, you can tell, right? Do you think of location-based data, right? Do you want them to know where you are, when, whenever you are, right? Um, this next step is the idea of combining all these different data sources, right? And providing a unified view for them. So you're, you're combining it all together so that you're eventually getting into a place where we could use it for our, our, our companies and our teams can actually access it in a way that's meaningful so that we can start gaining some insights. One tool that I found is actually that's really useful, I believe LMU is using it to teach, which I found very encouraging is, is this company called Alteryx. And I found, I found the interface really easy to use and it does a great job of, of combining of bringing in data sources from multiple places and they're actually their their back end or actually the front end you can start integrating some some uh some r queries as well and you could actually do some machine learning through alteryx as well and so this is actually turning into a really powerful tool to extract transform and load that's what etl stands for to really combine all your data um, one thing to note here though is you have to create some kind of a master key or master table that's gonna join all these different data sources together. So this could be meaning creating some kind of an internal ID or whatever it may be, um, but just keep in mind when you join that together, you have to have some kind, of, uh, some kind of a master key. So let's say we have all our data together now, right? Then this, this next step is called data democratization. Big word, but it basically means whoever needs access to the data can now get it. And it's a self-service model, right? Rather than having to go to a specialist to pull certain data for you, we're, we're trying to make this accessible so that people can do their analysis and that the data is consistent across the board, okay? So uh, even in the CFO article, right, the growing importance of data democratization, obviously some advantages are it empowers the users, there's gonna be accountability, data continues to grow, and it helps the culture change. There are definitely some cons as well, right? There's the security risk, which, which, which we just spent a lot of time over, when you bring it together, there's always the idea of, the, always the concern of making sure the quality and the accuracy is there. There's also the danger of someone, say, in marketing got a hold of the finance data and they don't know how to understand, say, certain definitions and they misrepresent the data. And there could also be duplication where different groups are trying to pull do the same analysis. So there are definitely some pros and cons to it, but the idea behind making the data available and making a self-service model is definitely a step in the right direction of becoming a data-driven company. Unfortunately, the reality is that there are data silos. And I think if, if we're gonna be honest with ourselves, we may at some point in time been guilty of this, right? Being a gatekeeper, I know I have, where you almost feel like that's part of your job security that, oh, if you want this kind of data, you gotta go through, go through Tim, right? But the the, the inefficiency behind it is, is mind boggling, right? And basically it becomes all storage and no action. So think about if you've acquired another company and you can imagine the silos that are, that are just being just the complication behind it, but we have to overcome that in order to truly move forward, right? And to cut down on inefficiency. And here's an example that, that I've seen happen over and over. So imagine you have a finance building, you have an operations group, and then you have a marketing team. And there's an industry report that goes that goes industry-wide, obviously. And yet each department is ordering the same report over and over. And the reason this is happening is because there is no internal communication between the respective lines of business. And you can imagine the cost and and even between different floors, right? And even between different cubicles, people are paying for the same thing over and over again because we failed to communicate with 
our neighbors with our internal teams. And so this is not the fault of the, the vendors, right? And in fact, they're doing their job by selling us their same Kool-Aid over and over. It is our fault for not communicating and breaking down our internal silos. We should just buy one report, make it company-wide, and then make it accessible, right? But this is just a simple example of the efficient inefficiency that data silos can bring. The less technical side of data management and data science is the idea behind data governance, right? And it's definitely not the fun part of it. It's yet it's fundamentally important, right? You just have to have the common definitions and the right formats in order to even move forward in becoming a data-driven company, right? What are, what are gonna be some of the rules, right? How are we gonna ingest new data? How are we gonna sunset some old data? How are we gonna check on data quality, data accuracy, you name it, right? And so we can go on and on about the importance of data governance. And here's an example of, let's say someone asked, what was last quarter's profit? Okay, and I know um, for those of us in business school, this should be pretty easy to answer, yet, what does it mean? What does profit mean, right? Does it mean gross profit or does it mean operating profit or EBITDA, right? Or does it mean net profit or does it even mean profit margin, right? And you can see if the CFO asks this question and you get three different profit answers for asking the same question, then we've all been there where we're scrambling like a fire drill to, to get the answer for that quarter number to our bosses. And if they all come out different, right? It just, it just looks terrible, right? And, but if we had the right definitions, right? If we had the right definitions, we had the right questions to be asked, then we can find ways to be consistent across all the lines of business, right? And obviously, these are, easy, these are ways we can um, improve our profit margin. And I'm sure all, all, all those who have taken Econ 101, these are, this is just review. But here's an example of the importance of having a single source of truth or having a golden record. So we're bringing in all this data, we have the right infrastructure, we have the right governance, we think in place, but what happens when we have conflicting data entries, right? And here's an example I wanna share with you. Imagine we have, I'll call it the Spider-Man the Spider -Man database, because obviously Spider-Man's a, um, a huge asset for us here at Sony, and so, from one source, let's say Spider-Man is spelled like that. Another source, the data is coming in with a space. The third one, you're getting a, a hyphen in between spider and man. The other one has a capital M. The other one is, is hyphen capital M. And the last one is the S and the M are capital. So the question to everyone here, which source is correct? A, B, C, D, E, or F? What is the golden record. What is the single source of truth for the correct way to spell Spider-Man? And don't go Googling, just go off of what you see here, A, B, C, D, E, or F. Okay, I see some answers coming in, okay. See some E's, I see some A's, D's, okay. And you can see how this is a, it seems easy, but it's actually very, I see a scooter man, I love it, okay, <laughs> none. And so actually, actually none may be correct, but here, here's, the, here's the correct answer. It is actually E, right? It's, it's a hyphen with a capital M. To be technically correct, the true answer is everything's actually capitalized, right? And has a hyphen. And so you can see with data governance, you need to have the right rules in place to make sure that if, if it comes in spelled incorrectly or spelled sort of like this, especially say coming from a, from a different data source overseas, you have to have the rules in place to say, even though it's spelled all in one word, we're gonna force it to point to this golden record, okay? And so, so here's just an example of, and, 
of a, uh, this is obviously a simple example, but something that we have to deal with on a, on a regular basis. And you can imagine the complexity when companies have to merge and databases need to be combined and think of the way customer addresses are inputted, right? All the different ways, street, street, avenue, abbreviation, right? You name it. And so the importance of, of having the right rules in place is fundamental to having um, the right data-driven culture. And so let's say we have the right leadership and let's say we have built a strong analytics foundation. Then the next step is to make sure we empower our team to have the right skills and training. And so if we think of data as being one of our products, we need to make sure we maximize the value of our product and our services. So let's think of, of DAS or data as a service here, right? And, you know, Snowflake, Weather Channel, IBM, SAP, HANA, Robinhood, these are all examples of where data is a service. If we think of data enhanced products, right? This is Tesla with their self-driving car, Snapchat with their smart glasses, or you could video videotape or take pictures, obviously, Ring with their smart products. CES recently in January, right, they had, um, door knobs where you can sense uh, a fever sensing doorbell. That's what they called it. So well, obviously with COVID, also germ killing uh, ultraviolet gadgets, smart face masks. These are all products that are coming in place right now. Athlete recovery is another one from Under Armour where it, it's a smart jacket. It tells you your body temperature, right? So you can imagine all these different products that are based on data. And even if you don't work in either of those two industries, data as insights is something that we can all relate to. And this is all gonna be important. Uh, Tableau is, is a great uh, visualization tool. I'll talk a little bit more about later, but whether you work in marketing, whether you work in finance, sales, or HR, to be able to leverage data to improve your operations, to improve your, your team is gonna be vital. And with that, then we need to make sure our education level with data has to be a lot better, right? If, if data is gonna be crucial, we need to make sure we improve our skill set. And based on a recent uh, US data literacy survey, 97% agree that data helps them do their job better. And 87% said that literacy, data literacy enhances their credibility. The problem is only 33% are confident in their data literacy skills. And this is the ability to actually read, analyze, and argue with the data. And 55% of those surveyed say they lack the education and resources to make sound decisions based on instinct, based on, based on insights. And so they're making decisions on gut feelings. So it kind of goes back to the Oakland A's, the old scouts saying, I'm just gonna go by gut. And so kind of taking a step backwards because we don't have the right education. And now we know everyone who's here, we know that data is a vast and growing field. And here are just a, an overview of some of the various branches of data literacy that's out there, right? Obviously on the left, we have fundamentals and it goes all the way on the right to data informed decision-making. Along the way, there's several different buckets. And honestly, this is a bit intimidating because it's such a wide and vast area. And when someone comes into a job interview and says that they are this unicorn that can solve all your problems in each one of these baskets, I would be very skeptical and I would press hard into their credentials and experience and have them prove that they can actually, that they've actually done some of this. The good news is that there are so many great resources out there right now online and kind of one of the blessings with working from home is we have this a little bit of flexibility rather than commuting, we have some opportunity to build our own skills on our own, right? And there's a ton of good ones here online, some free, some you have to pay. Obviously there's some good ones internally at your companies as well. Uh, what I found is sometimes vendor presentations have been really helpful here to peer learning. Um, for obviously those who are students, um, some of the, the best learning I did was learning from my smarter classmates. Uh, attending conferences is, is another great way to, to learn more as well. One thing I like to do uh, for my team is I said, okay, you can pick one conference to go to every year, 
but make sure you come back and you're going to present to the rest of our team what you learned. So if, we, if I had 10 people, they want to attend different conferences, then we're almost learning from 10 different people, 10 different conferences, and they come back and provide a good training. So for those of you who are in position to empower your, your teams to, to learn, I would say definitely, definitely encourage that. Even and now, I think with uh, with COVID, a lot of these conferences are even, they're offering for free. So please take advantage of that while you can. Kind of switching gears back to data collection as far as learning. Um, SQL it, it actually started back in the early '70s, I believe, and it was initially developed at IBM. Yet with the growth of data, I think SQL kind of made a strong comeback. And this is a great area to just start learning how to, how to pull the data, right? And it's, it's a language that where you can just go to retrieve data. And these are just some of the various data bases that are currently using SQL. Uh, I found that SQL is also helping me create custom variables in Tableau and other uh, software applications such as Altrix. Uh, listening to some of the professors earlier this, this evening, it's great to hear that SQL is being taught through some of your courses. And so definitely dive in and learn as much as you can. Uh, so once you query the data, right, then you have to report on it. And BI tools, there's so many out there, right? There's a ton of them out there. Uh, I would say there's pros and cons to, to a lot of these. And the basic benefit behind all these BI tools is that it helps it, it's it's user friendly and helps you to pull the data out in a way that's a lot more familiar and you can plot it uh, and visualize it in a lot easier way. One thing I want to I want to say for those who say don't come from a strong technical background, a good place to start is simply Excel. Right? We all have access to it. Start working with basic formulas. Right? Uh, learn about different data types. Learn about different dates. Dates is a huge a uh, huge complication in the formatting of how we date, short form, long form, long date, you name it, right? Um, work on if-then statements in Excel, work on pivot tables, work on V lookups, right? Work on plotting data. There's so many things that you can apply uh, working just with Excel. Data visualization is a huge growing market as well. And there's strengths and weaknesses for a lot of these, these, uh, these programs, these, these software tools as well. Um, personally, I like letting my analysts choose whichever BI tool or data visualization tool that they like. Um, but I know from a corporate perspective, it doesn't make sense to have to be paying for 10 different BI tools, right? Or, or visualization tools. Um, the downside of being locked into one particular tool, though, is sometimes these legacy companies are a little bit slower to jump onto the latest technologies versus these up and coming startups. So there's definitely a balance. Um, but the more you can learn and get your hands dirty and learning some of these tools, I think a lot of these skill sets can apply to various different software tools. And I like this quote, visualization is daydreaming with a purpose. So think about that as you're putting your story together. I want to end with uh, at least this section with some of the things you should avoid. Uh, just because these tools are so powerful, don't overload it with so many things that it, it's so hard to read, right? There's another bad example of having just way too many colors. And another bad example of just crunching your data on the left versus spacing it out where you can see the impact that single homes um, are truly the driver behind this data source, right, on the bottom left. Another example of that, of, of say managing up, they would ask for a monthly report on what are, how do we do last month from a streaming perspective, right? And this is kind of what we used to do. And so what I did was I gave them this, but I also realized this is just a snapshot in time. We could have had a really good month, really bad month, and there's no real baseline as to how well we're doing. And so I said, I gave them the report on the left, and then I said, how about this? Right. So I, I threw this in, a 13-month trend plot, and I added uh, some, the dashed line is the industry benchmarks. 
And so by showing them both, you you say, okay, here's here's what you wanted. And by the way, I you can also look, look at it this way. And so I'm glad to say we actually transitioned to the chart on the right, which provides a lot more insights, I would say, than just a snapshot in time. Another example was what was the company's performance last month? And this was the table that was being reported up to our CTO. And I'm like, you know, it's a nice colored chart, but what does it mean? I, can't, I couldn't make anything out of it. So I told my team, let's make it better. And we said, let's build in a map. And so right away, you can see the side, the diameter of, of the circles tells you which cities and how, how many customers we had and the impact of whether the health of our, our signal in those respective cities. So you can see the information overload in certain tables and spreadsheets. And sometimes a simple map can be a much better way to share the message. And sometimes you're just overwhelmed, right? With too many options, you don't even know where to start. And so this is a nice little table. If you want to compare, you want to distribute the data, whatever it may be, it's a nice little flow chart of, of where you can go. Tools such as Tableau, you can actually highlight some of your graphing options. So it, could tell, it tells you, you can't do this, you can't do that. So sometimes it makes it a little bit easier for you. Sometimes though, you may have a boss who's in love with a pie chart. And in that case, you can't do it with the data you've selected and you may have to go to Excel and find other data visualization options. Some other techniques, um, first and foremost, you wanna know your audience, right? And then you wanna know what is your goal behind your analysis? And I wanna just highlight a few more, obviously use the right visualization, not too much, not too little. And once again, tell, tell your story. Quick step, quick couple slides on the data analysis side. Uh, there's so many tools out there once again, and we're under the skill set. Remember, pill of trying to build our data-driven culture, and you need to have the right the right tools. And there's so many different things, but these are the ones that are currently being used. And I would say, as business students, right, you don't need to know how to use these. But the more you can learn, say, Python or R or some of the big data tools, then you're going to make yourself a lot more marketable. Uh, this is just a list of the top 10 machine learning algorithms based on an article. And linear regression, I'm sure we're all very familiar with. But one thing I want to emphasize here is, right, the importance of being able to make predictions, right, on your dependent variable y, right? So it comes down to our basic formula that we all learned in algebra, y is equal to f of x. And sometimes we get so caught up in building the model, building these tools, we get an answer from our machine learning algorithm. We don't understand what the output is. And so I can't harp enough on the importance of understanding just the basic math behind what is driving what, right? What, what variables are truly, uh, truly pulling the levers behind this model? And you need to understand that because when, when, when the decision makers push back on where you got your answer, or what's driving it, and if you can't answer what's under your, in your black box model, you're gonna lose all your credibility that you've built up. So let's, let's do a couple examples. And so clustering is a, big, is a very common and very, very powerful machine learning tool. You use it to group various data points, especially when you have a large data set. Can we discover something that would have gone uncovered? So let's take a look at some of these, uh, these movies and a data scientist colleague of mine provided this analysis, combining movie theater data with some census zip code data. So based on these 10 movie posters, what would you say is the genre or theme? And go ahead and type it in the chat window. You don't need to overthink it. Let's see who's, what's action romantic. Okay. African-American black voices. Okay, I see it. Okay, Kevin Hart. Okay, so the correct answer for this one, minorities, black ladies, yeah, okay. Is simply the African-American 
sorry, that was, that was the market that these movies went after. Okay, let's try a second one. Here's, here's some more movies. What would you say is the genre or theme behind these 10 movies? And go ahead and type your answer in the chat window. Okay, got some Christian, spiritual, feel good, religious. Yeah, okay. So I think you guys inspirational. Yeah, okay. And so the yeah, this, this, these movies were centered around around the Bible Belt, right in the South. Okay. And the last one. Okay, based on these ten movies, what would you say is the theme behind these movies? And this one's going to be a little bit tougher, so I'll give you a little more time to do this. Okay. Blockbuster sequels, popular movies, okay. Young Adult Adventure Ensemble, okay, okay. So, Memorial Day Weekend, oh, I like that one, okay. So, this one actually happens to be a, oh, movies for a couple, I like that. It actually turns out to be a bimodal, right? There's two, two kind of two different themes going at the same time. These were some movie theaters that were near military bases, and so their spouses would go attend as well. So it's, this one's a bimodal. And because of clustering, we were able to find these insights. I want to spend a little time on, on AI, right? Obviously another super hot field. And it's simply where the machine simulates the human mind, right? And in this movie, The, uh, the Revenant, uh, we wanted to find A-list actors, in this case, Leonardo DiCaprio. And see when he showed up, how many times he showed up, at what timestamp did he show up? And so before, before AI, we would literally have an intern or someone watch and pause and write down every time he showed up. The problem with this is we it turned out that in using AI facial recognition software, AI wasn't very accurate because as you can see in this picture, there were a lot of middle-aged white men with beards that look too similar, right? And so that was, uh, unfortunately, where AI did not work very well. Another case here where facial recognition is not working too well, um, and this is based on a federal study, and the problem is these models, right, they lack what they call, say, a moral compass, right? And so it's up to the machine learning researchers to ensure that the algorithms meet the ethical standards. So once again, the governance aspect is so important here and you need to have a human interpretation. So the best performing AI models has made many organizations prioritize complexity over explainability and trust. And it's obviously opening the door to potential biases. So it turned out in this study that African Americans and Asians were up to 100 times more likely to be misidentified than white men. Native Americans had the highest false positive as well based on this study. And it also turned out that it would inaccurately identify women compared to men uh, in this study as well. So there's still a lot of work to do in the AI field to decrease the amount of human bias. So, but there's still an opportunity. Uh, I think many of you may have read this AI headline um, where the prominent AI ethics researcher, right? She, she was fired, right? Because of the, the human and ethical consequences of AI development. And so once again, that's a, it's basically a very gray area where she felt the company was focused so much on the profit side that they were missing out on the human and ethical aspect of machines. So those are all just something to think about, which leads us to our last pillar of what do we need to do on the back end, right, to make sure that everything that we've done up front is working. And I think it comes down to a question that's often overlooked, yet it's crucial, is simply asking the so what question. And I intentionally also put a dollar sign there. And I found that whenever you can tie your analysis and tie your work to money, it definitely helps you refocus 
and make sure you're doing you're heading down the right path. And so data is a new currency. Um, you can see data is radically, right? Redefine the way we do business. And can we increase revenue? Can we increase the efficiency? Can we reduce expenses? Those are all things we need to be asking ourselves when we're working with data. If it doesn't, then we need to reshift. With the value of data increasing, there's a question of what is my actual data worth? And for many M&A activities, this is something that analysts have to go and try to actually quantify. And let's take a quick look at some of the acquisitions that Google has made uh, just in the last few years. Uh, YouTube in 06, Waze, I'm sure many of us use that. Nest, a Looker is a data visualization tool. And last but certainly not least, Fitbit was recently acquired by Google. Now, Google's primary revenue source, right, is online advertising. And I doubt that they have much interest in creating videos or worrying about traffic congestion or thermostats or even fitness products. I think the actual value is going to be behind the consumer data that they can collect from all these, from all these companies. So if Waze knows that you travel the 405 every day at 6 o'clock, and they somehow know that you are a big pizza eater, would you be surprised when, you know, you get a Papa John's uh, ad that pops up right as you're, as you're crossing the 101, right? And so these, there's so many opportunities for them to customize and target based on our needs or based on what we've, well, based on our online history. As more and more companies though, continue to build their data arm, let's say, of the company, there is, there is a disconnect right now where people are not, companies are not getting their value from their data scientists. And unfortunately, it's because the analytics is not aligning with the business, right? And that's where this translator or the bridge, the middleman between the data side and the business decision makers, there has to be that connection. And I think as business students, there's a great opportunity for us here to really to play that role and asking yourself, so what? Okay. And for those of us who have kind of been around, we've seen data grow, we've seen analytics grow. And the question is, where does where does that reside in your company? Right? Historically, data often resided with IT. Right, and then with the shift of business growth, we feel like sometimes it's gone to the business side. Uh, but I think in actuality, it should lie in between the technical and the non-technical, right? And it's a combination of science and art. And so it's a cross-disciplinary function that I think is fundamental in today's business culture. And so when you can join that gap to solve that problem, with data, then I think you can really find some insights and truly collaborate. KPI, another big word, buzzword, key performance indexes, right? And here's a question. If, if our KPI was, what is the, if your KPI was to have the highest grossing film in 2020, the question is, okay, which movie had the highest grossing film last year? Was it Bad Boys for Life, Sonic the Hedgehog, C, Parasite, D, Star Wars, or E, 1917? Star Wars is the, the Skywalker one. And so I see some answers coming in. Okay. And remember, this is for 2020. Okay. And so the correct answer actually is Bad Boys for Life, because it came out in January, right around Martin Luther King. And as we all know, movie theaters shut down in March. And so Sony, we lucked out in the sense that we're an answer to a trivia question of 2020's highest grossing film goes to Sony, right? And so if you had a KPI that said you want to be the highest grossing film, you can see that that's going to be a misleading KPI. If you have, let's say you, you work in sales and your KPI is to have the most number of phone calls, then you can see how that's gonna be misleading because you can almost program these robots to call 
And that doesn't mean you're gonna convert these calls to, to actual sales. So the importance of having the right North Star is going to be fundamental to the success of your company. Uh, just a few more slides here. We want to be able to, so let's say we have everything in place. We need to, we need to uh, get the word out of kind of how the culture is shifting in our companies. And so we have to practice what we preach and we have to be able to lead others with the success that we've actually proven. And we need to challenge ourselves, even if the data is not necessarily quantitative, are there ways we can transform qualitative data to make better decisions? One of the things that we've worked on and has been successful is a, a two-prong approach, right? We've done a top-down and a bottom approach to really improve the communication and to bridge this gap between data and the decision makers in the C-suite. So we would have a BI day, a business intelligence day, where we would invite senior executives and vendors, and they'd come and speak from their perspective of how data is helping their day-to-day -day business, the dollar value that it's actually helped them save or even earn. And then we've had also quarterly lunches, monthly lunches of lunch and learns, right? Where we learn from one another. And so, so kind of having this two prong approach I found has been pretty, pretty effective, obviously than just, just only doing one. This last section of data storytelling, which I know I've, I've harped on quite a bit. Uh, it's just so important. You can have all the right you could have done everything right until now, but if you don't convey your message in a way that's gonna be engaging, then you're gonna not influence the decision makers in the correct way. And so here's just a little, kind of a little guideline once again. And so uh, I think one way is to obviously provide good insights, provide good visualization, but also to find ways to tie it into revenue once again, right? Tie it into dollars. And you'll, I guarantee you'll get the attention of the decision makers if you tie it into, in, into money. And so in, in summary, I just wanted to uh, go over kind of what we did, right? We talked about Moneyball and the value behind making decisions based on data rather than one's gut. Uh, then we discussed some of the key pillars that are needed to cultivate a data-driven culture. And if data is the new oil and data is king, but you need to make sure you have um, the right leadership, right? It's gotta start from the top. If data is the new water, then we really need to have good plumbing so that the data is accurate and consistent across all the systems. And you need to have the right governance. If we think of data as a product, then we need to know what our product is and we need to have a better and improved data literacy skill set and visualization. And, and you can't just blindly trust the uh, machine learning outputs. And lastly, if, if data is our new currency, then there's a radical shift to how we're going to operate our business. And we need to be able to tell that story that bridges the gap between data and dollars. Um, and so this reflection is going to be really key to driving a data driven culture. And with that, um, thank you once again, everyone, for making time out of your busy schedules and for staying so engaged. It's truly been an honor and pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim, for your presentation. It's so engaging. And just seeing all the chats pop up with your questions was just so awesome. So thank you. And, and to all of our attendees, thank you for those of you who have typed in your questions and for upvoting your most favorite ones um, that we will be asking uh, Tim. So let's go ahead and get started since we have some time left. So the first question is from Sylvia. How can data analytics help manage a small business? That's a great question for a small business. I would say even for a small business, you're going to have data, right? It could be, even be simple as sales data, your own sales data. Uh, in this day and age with social media data, can you correlate, let's say positive likes, positive sentiments, people's comments. Um, you could also obviously plot say from January to December of whenever you started your business and look at how sales have improved 
let's say you see a spike, was that attributed to say a marketing campaign that we did? Was it because we hired this new person um, from LMU and an intern and they helped us find this new opportunity? And you can truly see some patterns, even if it's a small data set. So even if it's small, you, you know, there's no, there's nothing wrong with starting small. And if you need to enhance data, there's there's so many third-party data sets out there that you could actually purchase and you could combine, like Experian obviously is another company and you can combine say credit card data and say, okay, this person uh, happens to not only like pizza, but they also really, um, really like shopping at, at Amazon, right? And so there's ways to correlate and to really target and to be more effective in your email and marketing campaigns. So even if you're small, don't let that uh, dissuade you from, from delving into uh, to using it, right? And, and go ahead and make mistakes like we talked about. Make mistakes, learn, um, reach out to, to, to peers, reach out to friends and see, uh, reach out to people who are maybe someone from a completely different industry and see if there's something you can learn from them as well. Great, thank you. So this one has been upvoted from Julian. What is the biggest trend in ML machine learning, big data you anticipate will blow up next year? Oh, geez, that's, that, that's, a, that's a loaded question. I would say, and this is coming from, from, um, from say a, a product perspective from, from CES. It seems like COVID is not going away, unfortunately, right? And so we've seen companies such as Zoom take off, right? We've seen companies like Netflix take off because people are staying home and 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 um, and the streaming more. So I would say if if COVID is still around till till the fall, then anything that's going to help people. Um, do work from home, right? Do things more efficiently, then that's going to help. On the flip side, when things open up and return kind of quote unquote back to normal, I think the vacation industry, um, people who have kind of been saving up for, for trips, I think airlines, uh, cruises, I think those are opportunities where people are going to just they're itching to get out of get out of the house, right? And so I think we've seen we've seen uh, like people doing a lot of home improvement right now because they're staying at home. But once they can get out of the house, I think people are going to jump on the opportunity to to travel again. And I, but but on to the, actually speaking of machine learning, so machine learning anything to kind of help revolving around COVID because it's such a a dominant an elephant in the room. Anything along those lines is going to is going to uh, is going to blow up, in my opinion. Great, Anna, do you want to do a yes, question? Uh, thank you, Nola. Tim, that was a that was a really great talk. It covered. Uh, I like the way you did your four pillars, uh, bringing it all together and uh, giving us all perspective on what to take away. So thank you so much for that. Uh, this is a question from uh, Ia uh, Lindahl, uh, who is one of my students. It's also been upvoted. And so she's asking about what has been the biggest roadblock you've encountered in the fast-paced industry of data analytics? Wow, that's a great question. I would say the biggest roadblock is, is data silos, I think. Um, and that, that's the human aspect of it, right? That's the human, the human aspect of, of fear, right? A fear of letting control, of saying, this is kind of my domain. If I share it with the larger team, is my worth is my contribution is going to be worth less, right? So I think that's one aspect. And people like to say, oh, I'm all in, I'm all in. Yet when it comes down to, am I really all in or am I comfortable with it? I kind of like the, you know, the way it's been. I have kind of my cush position. Um, you know, I may only be X number of years from retirement. Uh, I'm okay with that. And so to have them jump on board and fully integrate, uh, you can think of examples such as uh, Blockbuster, Right, Blockbuster or Kodak. Those are the classic business school cases 
uh, people who are leaders in their respective industries, right? They, I, I got this camera, I got the, 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 the whole um, digital market, you know, they got the whole uh, photography industry cornered. And then when people came out with digital cameras, like, oh my gosh, uh, Kodak was way too late to shift. Blockbuster, the uh, classic story of Netflix that it started because they, was charged, they were charged this exorbitant fee to return a, a VHS tape to Blockbuster. Was, I forget what the amount was. They're like, there's gotta be a better way, right? And so, um, so I think those silos of not wanting to share is definitely a big factor. Then the other factor is data quality. I think it still is very messy. Um, as the data comes together, it's amazing how many fat fingering issues there still are. People still manually entering data in this day and age when we should be using APIs and calls to pull in the data. Um, I don't think there are enough checks and balances within the data quality. We sometimes as, as data, data engineers, data architects, data scientists, we're like, oh, the code worked, we, everything's coming in, but we don't do a good enough job of checking, especially say three months after it start working. When we're first bringing it in, we do a lot of checks and then down the road, we often forget because we're off, we're on to our next project. So I think there is, there is an opportunity there to really improve. And lastly, I think with the speed of it, how everything's going, we don't do a good enough job of going back and learning from say our models, right? So we had our first prediction, but we don't go back and say, how can we have made that better with the new data that we've now acquired, with the new skills that we've acquired, with the way the industry is changing? Are there ways to really learn and tweak and make my model better? So I think those are kind of the three, three big areas I want to mention. Those are great. Thank, thank you, Tim. Uh, one more from, uh, from uh, Professor Mascari uh, Mustafa. He's asking for a friend, how should I prepare for a data science analytics job interview? I think this will be relevant to our students as well. That's a, that's a great question for, um, I think for the data science position, it's actually a lot easier because it's, it's much more black and white, right? If you're hiring strictly for someone who want who you're built who you're asking for them to to code, then there are interviews now where they literally will test you on your R skills, your Python skills, your SQL skills. So that that's what I can find. You can strengthen that. The harder part and the important part to really distinguish yourself in the job market is now that you've done your model, you've built your model, you've got you've got that part built. Can you explain your results in layman's terms to someone who's non-technical? Can you really make that bridge? Can you present your data? Can you tell a story that's gonna convince a non-technical person that your super duper machine learning algorithm is gonna solve this problem and explain it in layman's terms? I think that's what's going to differentiate uh, you from getting a job in, in say a data analyst role. Great, thank you for that. I think that's really helpful and great advice for our students. Um, Professor Wong um, has a question. How would AI change our current data-driven practices? <laughs> or has it? <laughs> has it, I mean, I, I, so, you know, I, Full, full disclosure, full transparency, I would say as, as much as I've been in the, in the data world, the technical world, most of my career, there's a side of me that shies away from, from being um, so willing to share all my data, to sign up for the latest apps, to sign up for, for everything, right? And the, the reason is because I don't like I don't like Big Brother knowing everything I'm doing, right? What they're, what I'm watching, what I'm spending on, um, and especially during COVID, I feel like do they really need to know all that, right? I feel like the less is more. Um, but I feel like the way think of think of uh, the Internet of Things, like at a home, right? 
there's great marketing products of the refrigerator will tell you no, will let you know when you're out of milk, right? And so, and one to, on one side, that's great, right? So this machine is thinking for me and anticipating when I'm going to run out of milk. And yet, at the same time, do I really need my Samsung refrigerator to tell me that, right? And they know that I just went to Trader Joe's and bought milk again, right? Do I? And, and can you imagine? And also with your thermostat, and you tie that in to your, your Nest thermostat, and they know between the months of July and September, the temperature is set at 76 degrees, and this is their utility bill. And it's actually fascinating data, but do I really want them to know all that? But I'll tell you this, this is where companies are gonna keep pushing, keep pushing and keep pressing to know more and more about you so that, and just think about even when you go on Amazon, your search history is so embedded that they just start popping up left and right. And it's kind of scary when what you look for on your phones are showing up on your computer at work. You're like, whoa, how did they get that, right? And so um, AI is gonna continue to go down and try to monetize us, especially here in America. I feel like in this consumerism world that we live in, and we're guilty of it. And we're trying to sell you more and more of our movies. Go watch more and more of our shows, right? More and more. And that's what we're, that's, that's the world we live in, right? And so on one side, it's very exciting because it's doing all the thinking for us. On the other side, it's actually very scary. I would agree with you there. Um, <laughs> so we have another question from one of our students from Forrest. Hello, Forrest. Um, what is some wisdom you've learned about carving out your own career path? You know, if I, if I told you that I went from rocket science to, in, to entertainment, right? I feel like those are two very disparate worlds, right? And so, and especially a nonprofit aerospace engineering firm to now a huge conglomerate such as Sony, I would have never imagined that to be my career path, right? So even after I got, I got my MBA, my initial goal actually was I really wanted to get into sports. And I was a huge sports guy, still a big, I wanted to go into sports marketing. I go, maybe I could, I could do that. But I didn't want to be like, like a, a, like a data nerd, like Moneyball. I, 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 want, I didn't like that. I wanted to actually be more on the sports marketing side. I wanted to be kind of, kind of on, on the front lines. But then I realized uh, after business school, I, I was too old to start from the bottom and selling, selling tickets or selling peanuts. And then uh, I didn't have enough connections to, to move up into an MBA role in the sports world. Um, but I think what what has helped me, there's a great book out there called The Growth Mindset that Professor Ann, I think is from up in uh, Stanford wrote that book. It's a great book that I read a few years ago and it's the idea of being open to failing, right? And failing quickly. And I think uh, a lot of us who are successful in school, we're so used to getting our A's and we're getting complimented. Oh, you got good grades, you got good attendance. And yet we're afraid to go out and, and make mistakes, right? And so um, the wisdom I would say is to continue to keep an open mindset, right? I think for someone like me who's getting older now and there's times when things are changing so quickly, I have to be open to learning new software tools, learning um, with the way social media is trending, right? And just being able to keep up with that. Uh, always learning from not only your peers, but also your younger peers and your more experienced peers and keeping, keeping your, your mind open to, uh, to, to what could be next, right? And so um, don't get too comfortable. Uh, that's one thing I, I remember uh, my boss telling me early on, don't get too comfortable where you're at and continue to, continue to learn and then, and then see, what doors, see what doors open up. Wonderful, such great, great, great advice. Um, we've got a couple more minutes uh, for a few more questions. So Joseph's asks, what steps do you think need to be taken in the future within the private sector government level, governmental level to protect company data and intellectual property primarily concerning China? Oh, geez, it sounds like a, um, 
a debate question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know enough about the, the say like, you know, there's all these theories about China spying in on us and stuff like that. Uh, what role does government have? Um, here's an example of, of COVID, right? One of the reasons why countries such as South Korea has been able to be more successful in keeping, what do you say, uh, flattening the curve for COVID is because their citizens are much more open to sharing their location-based data with their phones. So if they know that Tim Park is positive and he was at this church at this time and there were 500 other people at that church on that day, then the government can go and say, hey, you guys all need to quarantine, right? Here in America, we love our freedom, right? And that kind of comes, um, there's pros and minuses, pros and cons with that, right? And so we, we love our and value our freedom and we hate being told what to do, right? So we've even politicized wearing a mask, right? And that's unfortunate. It's like, oh my God, people are dying. And they're saying, oh, it's, it's not real, right? And so unfortunately, not to sound too political, but I feel the objective data is needed to hopefully present the facts in a way that's not too left, that's not too right, that's actually just objective central views on this is the data, this is what it's showing, here's the death rate, here's the infection rate, and then leave it at that and let people decide and say, go ahead, you can make, you can have your biases based on political, religious, whatever it may be, but here's what the data says, right? And to be objective in that, I think the government can do a better job of laying out their data in a more objective way. And that goes for uh, even companies, right? Just to be objective and saying, here's my model, here's my results, but these are the assumptions I made into this model, right? And so being upfront with it, rather than being pitched, being trapped in the corner afterwards saying, where'd you get that number? And then you have to backtrack and say, oh, I got it by assuming this, this, and that. If you're just upfront with it, I think that's a much better approach that we could take. I think um, obviously, regimes such as China, where personal freedom is much more suppressed, they don't have that kind of flexibility, right? So, but here in America, I think we have that advantage of being able to think on our own to be able to express our opinions without having to worry about um, backlash. But with that freedom, I think we need to use more wisdom in making our decisions and be more improve actually our data literacy of understanding, okay, this is what this means. Great, perfect. So um, Tim, I'm gonna stop sharing your screen for just one moment. And, sure. um, and also uh, for those, for our freshmen that are joining us today, I wanna thank you all for hanging tight and um, you know, uh, listening to the presentation and so forth. So here is the CBA Advantage. Um, QR code. So please feel free to scan it. And I'm going to go ahead and ask him one last question before we go and it gives you enough time to scan your QR code. So this is from Xin Yu. Um, in, reliab in reliability engineering or in the business world, we have to deal with limited data using quote unquote bias models to make decisions. From your experience, how should we minimize the risk of making a bias decision in this situation? You know, when I first started in, uh, in aerospace engineering, the problem I had was we didn't have enough data, right? And we had very limited samples of, you only had like 10 launches a year, trying to predict the next launch failure success is very limited. So what we had to do is we had to be upfront with, this is our data set, nothing to hide. And we say, okay, here's, here's our 10 flights. Here's the number that succeeded. Here's the one that failed. And you just have to be upfront with it. And so, um, at the same time now with this growth of data, there are ways to append it, right? And so find some ancillary data sets that you could bring in that could possibly add some value. And you won't know it unless you try and fail, right? Trial and error, you try it. But be upfront with your assumptions and then lay out 
the facts that you see and say, based on these assumptions, based on this limited data set, this is my takeaway. And what I like to do in my analysis is to give the decision maker, say, three options and say, if you go with option A, this is what it is. These are the financial consequences, pros and cons of this decision. Here's decision B, pros and cons, C, pros and cons. So what you've done by doing that is you've helped make, you've done the hard thinking and analysis for your decision makers, and it helps them on the spot to be able to trust you more and to build your credibility. So even if you have limited data, first try to do the best you can with it, see if you can augment it, and then lay out your assumptions, lay out the scenarios. I think that's what's worked for me in the past. Wonderful. We're, well, we are exactly at 8 p.m. Um, I just personally, on behalf of CBA, want to thank you, Tim, for joining us tonight. And I'll let Anna close with any closing remarks. Uh, I want to join you, Nola, and um, um, our uh, Dean faculty students, and thanks, Tim. Uh, this was really, uh, you can see from the comments uh, of the attendees, lots of fantastic presentations. Uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us again. Um, uh, and and um, uh, and for answering our questions, bearing with us, all of that. Thank you again. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Wonderful. Well, have a great night, everyone. And again, thank you for joining us for LMU Business Insights webinar. And we'll see you next time. We'll have one on February 4th focused on marketing. So we'll see you all soon. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Have a good night.